Jesus Christ, God the Father Almighty and the Holy Spirit. We thank you for everything, concerning everything and everything. We thank you for all of your blessings, for giving us life, for giving us the desire and the knowledge to, to comprehend the depth and width and breadth of your love for us. Be with us always, bless us this day. Help us to grow in you and to be vehicles for salvation and for the service. Through the never-ending intercessions of the Holy Mother of God, Saint Mary, and all the quiet of your saints, make us worthy to pray thankfully our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive us. Lead us not out of temptation. <coughs> Okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and God. Um, we're starting a new ser uh, series. Uh, so what we were thinking of uh, now that bless you, now that we were going through the importance of living a deep, connected life with the Lord and Savior, the automatic response, kind of like what we were saying in. The, the gospel of today, we said there's two automatic responses in receiving the blessing of God. Do you remember? I didn't put it that way, but it was implied. So when, when uh, St. Peter and the apostles witnessed the multitude of the fish, they, they did, St. Peter did what? He repented, very good. And then the Lord basically told him, from now on, you're going to start serving. Okay. <coughs> so, the same thing for us. Now that we understand how to be connected to the Lord and to our family and to live a deep life of prayer, uh, that's not enough. <laughs> God is going to ask us or to call us to uh, strive to do uh, for the kingdom, for the sake of bringing every person perfect in the Lord. So, if God allows us to be that uh, means by which people come closer to Him and to the church, then what oftentimes what happens is we get caught off guard or people start asking us questions and we don't necessarily know how to respond or respond effectively or maybe we don't know enough about a certain aspect of the church. <clears throat> so uh, basically what we're going to go through today um, is a brief introduction <coughs> and then God willing after that. Um, <laughs> you can hear me, right? <laughs> Sorry, there's been some technical difficulties. Um, we're trying to uh, to improve the technology, but sometimes there's always a little lag until we get it right. So <clears throat> basically, uh, what I was saying is, um, this week we're going to talk, uh, give a brief introduction about the church and how to present the church to others. And then after that, we're going to respond to a lot of the common questions that other people may ask us. Um, and if you have any in particular, uh, that maybe baffle you or you'd like to learn more about, please let us know and we'll pr try to incorporate it in into the different um, theme. So basically the theme is more apologetics or giving a response, like St. Peter said. <coughs> Be ready to give a defense to all those who ask you a reason uh, for the hope of <coughs> that is in you. So... Um, Basically, let, let me start with this. When you are asked about your faith or your church, what do you respond? How do you describe the Orthodox Church or the Coptic Orthodox Church? What do you say? I say it's like the Greek Orthodox and the Coptic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a lot of people do that. But what if they don't know what Greek Orthodox is? They normally do that. <laughs> Because a lot of people ask me and they have no idea, they say, oh, so you're a rabbi. I'm like, no, <laughs> you're, getting, you're, you're getting it all wrong. Um, okay, so you go into the history and talk about the, the, the ancient history. Um, very good, it is 
It is one of the oldest churches. What else? It's not convincing enough sometimes for people. So, like, part of the reason is not just to give them knowledge, but hopefully to spur their interest so they can get to know the Lord. And maybe if they don't even have a church, to go to, to your church. Hmm? <coughs> so be even the Lord Jesus Christ and the Virgin Mary. Very good. So say, oh, so you're Catholic. <laughs> Okay. Okay, very good. Anything else? I told it's the purest form of Christianity. Ah, that's good. I've never heard that one before, but pure, the purest form of Christianity. Um, <clears throat> it's like, but a lot of times, I mean, I'm not going to tell you what's right and what's wrong, but sometimes we have to take care on how we present because if we come across two boldly or proudly like I say oh you, you're just full <laughs> you know or um, if we downplay it they're like oh you're just like everybody else <laughs> right so um, I, I don't have like a, a perfect answer but basically um, one way of describing what our church is about is by dividing it into three different categories for, for people to understand um, <coughs> and so um, what, was I gonna, what I was going to do was basically just go through the three different categories and as, as you see fit or the need to introduce a certain aspect of that, um, you start with it. So basically, we go, we say Coptic Orthodox Church, but we go backwards. So we talk about what the church is, meaning Christianity, and then we talk about orthodoxy, specifically the holy tradition of the church and then the lastly we talk about the the Coptic aspect or the historical and cultural aspect not necessarily culture but um, uh, the like we whenever we talk about Egypt we start going into the history most of the time okay um, <clears throat> of course I would say and don't quote me wrong or don't misunderstand me but I would say it is of the, w the reason why we're going church Orthodox Coptic is because it's more essential um, to be Christian than it is to be Coptic, right? <laughs> or to be Egyptian, and and so forth. <coughs> um, and this will also help you understand when when you respond to people, because sometimes you'll have a dialogue with someone who's already Christian, so you don't have to go into the Christian aspect. Um, or you, other times you will have a response or you'll have a discussion with someone who doesn't believe in God at all. So, so you're not going to talk to him about Egypt, right? <laughs> you, have to, you have to focus on the, the, the faith first, okay? Um, so let's go to the first part. When you're talking about the church or Christianity, how do you define or describe Christianity to someone? What's the easiest guideline that we have? Just saying the name of Jesus Christ. The divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible. The, the Bible. Anything else? I think the church already has a very easy summary for us. The, the creed, the creed of the, the, the church. And most Christians, and I would be bold enough to say every Christian should believe in the creed. Um, because it was written, as we know, in a period of time when the church was one and there were no divisions, or it was the reason for divisions because people didn't believe in some of the words that were uh, written down. So, you know the creed, we're not going to go into the depth of it. <coughs> But there are many references that we have. Um, and <coughs> simply, if you think about the creed, it covers the majority of the importance of our doctrine. Not all of it, but the majority of it. So, which is what? I'm not going to go into the, to the creed, but at least. So, we talk about the unity of the Trinity. We talk about God the Father, the Pantrakartor, who created heaven and earth and all things seen and unseen. And then 
we talk about what most people, especially in the early church, but even till now, deny the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ as well as his humanity. So it goes into his incarnation, his passion, his crucifixion, his resurrection, <coughs> his ascension, <coughs> and his second coming, right? Um, and uh, then we also talk about the Holy Spirit, which we don't speak about enough, unfortunately. <coughs> and we, uh, at the end though, it's not just the Holy Trinity. What do, we, what do we talk about after we say, yes, we believe in the Holy Spirit? Give of life, peace from the Father, who with the Father and Son is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets and in one only holy catholic and apostolic church right so we talk about the importance of the church even in our creed and that's we'll, we'll talk about that in the in the next part um and what else one baptism for the remission of sins so this is the sacramental life or the liturgical life the importance of that thank you thank you um and then the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come. So this is talking about eternity and the second coming <coughs> and heaven. Okay. Um, again, we're not going to go into the, the details of this, but this just reminds us of some of the important points that we need to discuss with those who don't understand or believe in Christianity at all. Uh, these are the main points that we need to hit. If you look at the book of Acts and the apostles when they preached to those who didn't believe, what did they focus on, the majority of their preaching? Take a guess. <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ, and his, especially His suffering, His death, and His resurrection. That, that's like the summary. <laughs> if, if you have to water it down as much as you can, that's what you focus on. Um, of course, we're not watered down, but you're not going to start talking a deep, uh, you know, theological conversation about um, uh, uh, theosis <laughs> with with someone who doesn't even believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So, so that's what we're talking about: the the, the, the different levels or where you start. Uh, even also, you talk about this with our kids. Sometimes we fast forward into educating them in the spiritual life and we skip over the Holy Trinity and we go into, okay, agios, <laughs> right? Um, so we also have to be aware of this more when it comes to how we raise uh, our children, okay? So, um, simply put, like when you talk about Christianity or what true, true Christianity is, um, I don't know why I keep re referring to this, but the church also has summarized it in, in the theme of the year. Like we say, we, we focus on the love of God the Father, the grace of His only begotten Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> and the true believer, or the true Christian, has a daily experience with God in these three aspects. Okay? So we have to push ourselves also to contemplate and to experience the love of God as our Father, the grace of His Son, and or our heavenly bridegroom and how to be in fellowship or to live in fellowship uh, with the Holy Spirit. I'll just read a, uh, one quote from uh, Abu Natadra's Melody. Um, almost there. He said, For us, we acknowledge God as more loving than our parents and friends, closer than our own limbs, and more necessary to us than our hearts. So he's saying, For the real believer, God is very, very, very close to us, more than our own selves, more than our hearts, more than our family and friends. Um, and if we get this right, then most likely people will ask you, you know, why are you so happy today? Or how come you're different? Or I sense that, you know, when you come, go to church or come back, you, you, you're more empowered or more enlightened or something's different. <coughs> um, Yes. Yes. Um, where it says creed of faith, colon summary. Yeah. One more. Oh no! Sorry. One more slide. 
I forgot to do that. I, it kind of bugs me when it's you have to press a click for every bullet. Okay, yeah, so this is the, the, the quote that we we're talking about, the last one. For us, we acknowledge God as more loving than our parents, closer than our own limbs, and more necessary to us than our hearts. Um, so this is what we talk about being perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, um, bringing everyone perfect uh, in the Lord, the daily experience that we have with Him. And <coughs> like St. Gregory of Nazianzus, he said, remember God more than you breathe, <laughs> um, which is the true experience uh, of uh, the Holy Trinity in, in the believer's life. Okay, So that's a general summary. <laughs> of Christianity. I know it's, it's, it's very watered down, but just to give you an understanding of what things we need to discuss with those who, who, who uh, question us about this. Yes? Um, when somebody asked about the difference between the Catholic mm -hmm. and the Orthodox. Yes, yeah, so, um, talking about the difference between Catholic and Orthodox, that's going to be one of the questions that, uh, so stay tuned. <laughs> in, in maybe a week or two, we're going to, because that's very in-depth. And um, also it needs more uh, updating from me because we're not changing, but some of the dogmas are, are uh, changing a little bit from, from over the years. You have a question or stretching? No, I was going to say, you know, <coughs> someone is Catholic, I, I mean, even though there are a lot of differences, there's no point in getting into a... Right. Right, um, because again, the first point of Christianity is like, we believe in the same creed, relatively speaking, okay? Um, there's, there's one part that we used to disagree on, and I'm not even sure if we still disagree on it, but that's why we, like, if, if you have the, the opportunity to spend your time or to convince a Catholic or an atheist who are you going to go for? <laughs> it's obvious. <laughs> right? Yes? The church started by St. Mark a long time ago. Yes. One of the apostles of Jesus. So he gave us exactly what was preached at the time of Jesus. So that's the foundation of us. It's coming from basically the Jesus Christ teaching. Yes. Yes. So the foundation of our Christian teaching. Um, but you also have to understand um, the Lord through his apostles, was laying a foundation for the church. So he had to lay down the bases and the, the important theological uh, preliminaries. But that doesn't mean that's the only thing we preach. Like, that's what we start with. But, like, just like a building, that's the foundation, but there's many stories uh, after that. Um, so, I mean, you're, you're definitely right. But the church fathers... <coughs> who came one to five centuries, you know, after that or so, they built on that and they started going in depth more than, than just, but they would always refer back to the same importance of especially the passion and the resurrection of the Savior. Um, very good. Okay, so um, we'll change, uh, switch to the next slide. So now let's go into orthodoxy. So this is a little more, I think, uh, necessary for us to discuss because I think we have a good hold of what Christianity is about, right? Um, and we all know, I hope, you know, the creed and memorize it, so it's, it's, it's easy to refer to that. There's a lot of Bible verses and, and, and things that we, we, we can do to support uh, that, but uh, reading one simple book could help, you know, reinforce our, our uh, response uh, to, to the non-believers. So in terms of orthodoxy, uh, we always talk about the definition of orthodox, ortho meaning straight, um, <coughs> or way, uh, or, or right, um, and, and doxa meaning way, or faith, or worship, or teaching. Um, but it's actually more than just the right faith, or the sound doctrine, or the sound way of life. Um, for the fathers, it refers to the, the church in, in a, a much wider sense, um, meaning like the ship of salvation by which we receive the true faith, the, the true teachings, the true characteristics, the true con way of life, the conduct, the stature and the, and the glorification of the bride of Christ. So it's a lot more beautiful than what we narrow it down to, but at least we can say like 
If you're orthodox, <laughs> you're traditional. Okay. Um, unfortunately, this word is taken out of context in today's society, um, and we have to re-educate ourselves and others about what tradition really means and what holy tradition really is. It's not just customs that we do um, because you know our forefathers did it many years ago. Um, it depends on what the custom is and why we do it and how it pertains to our salvation. Um, but for the most part in terms of orthodoxy when they ask we say okay there's two main families there's the Oriental, which is us, believe it or not. <laughs> it's just another word for East uh, and the Eastern. <coughs> and this is a brief list of um, the, the, different, the two different families. Each family is pretty much in communion with each other, so, uh, but not, inter, not in between the families, not yet. We're still working on that dialogue. And there's a historical reason for this, and we'll get into it in a, in a couple of slides. But basically, it happened at the Council of Chalcedon after Ephesus. So we believe in the three councils, right? Nicaea, Constantinople, and Ephesus, right? We say 300 assembled at, 318 assembled at Nicaea, 150 at Constantinople, 200 at Ephesus. Those are the three councils that we recognize and the result, there were a lot of results, but the main result from those three councils was the creed, <laughs> right? We already believed in the creed for centuries before that, but this was the time that it was written down to respond to the false teachings that were out there. Anyway, um, so the Oriental Orthodox, we only believe in these three councils and the Eastern, because we split after this, they have other councils. Um, that's not uh, the Western Church. Church we'll see in a couple of slides. It's uh, it's pretty complicated. <laughs> um, but the Eastern Orthodox was still united with the Western Church until what we call the Great Schism. For us, the Great Schism was uh, was uh, Chalcedon. But for the Eastern Orthodox, the Great Schism was when the Eastern Orthodox split from the Roman Catholic Church and the rest of the West. <coughs> Um, so in terms of being tra traditional, we talk about, well, we're a Bible-based church, just like all the other people who say uh, we're Bible-based, but then they say we're sola scriptura, or we only believe in the Bible, we say, no, we can't do that. And that, maybe that will be another discussion that we have, it's like, why, why can't we be Bible only? Um, but we say, what, <laughs> I think I asked you this before, what came first, the tradition or the Bible? Right. <laughs> the tradition came first because the Bible, well, the Old Testament was written before the time of Christ. But when was the New Testament completed? Approximately. Huh? No, the, the New Testament. When, that's, that's when it was uh, announced and proclaimed that these are the books. Sorry, but when was the last book, Revelation, finished? Around 95, 90 AD, right? And when was the, the ascension of the Lord approximately? When was the Lord crucified? 33 years old. 33 years old. So either 33 AD or some historians say around 29 AD. So you have between around 30 AD till 95. So what's going on there? Tradition, <laughs> okay? That's how the word of God or the teaching was passed from generation to generation by word of mouth and by the holy life. After the first witnesses started to be martyred and to die um, uh, or repose in the faith, then the church said, okay, we have to write this down. We have to make sure we, we have it right from the first, uh, first accounts, okay? Um, so this shows us, even when St. Paul comes and says, um, uh, the rest I will, um, the rest I will discuss with you when I come, right? It's not in the Bible, so we can't say Bible only, right? There was there's a lot of rest that that's not there. Anyway, um, we'll, we'll talk more about that uh, later. Um, so, how do we get our faith or our tradition? 
you know, from the Holy Bible, of course, first and foremost, from the writings of the fathers, the patristics, um, which includes the teaching of the apostles and their disciples, which is not all mentioned in the Bible. Um, and these were the fathers or the saints who were, um, they knew their Bible in and out much more than any scholar you meet today. Um, without computer, <laughs> it, was all, it was all up here. Um, I was just uh, speaking with the servants last night and we were saying that if you collect all of the writings, um, sorry, all the references of the Bible, and we, we took maybe about six or seven fathers, right? Um, you would uh, come up with, I think the number was about 36,000 verses from the Bible. And it would be every verse, you could collect everything from the, from the New Testament at least, um, except for 11 verses. So when we say that the, the, the Bible is authentic and true and it hasn't changed from generation to generation, this is living proof of that. But um, they didn't have concordances, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have you know, Google, but even some of the fathers wrote their um, writings when they were like St. Athanasius or St. Anthony in the middle of the desert without any reference. Not, probably um, all they had was the Bible itself. Even if that, St. Athanasius wrote some of his writings when he was in exile. Who knows if he, if he even had uh, the Bible with him. I'm sure he did, but... Um, so anyway, uh, we take from the patristic writings, from the Holy Bible, <coughs> and this is a big one, is the mysteries of the Church. Um, we, as the Catholics, prioritize the mysteries into seven sacraments, but we have a lot more than that. Um, and uh, we, again, we don't have time to go into that, but this is a very essential part of orthodoxy. You can't take the liturgy away from orthodoxy because there's almost nothing left. Um, yes, we have the Bible, yes, uh, but how do we live the Bible or how do we live a unified life with the Lord through, like we say, one baptism for the remission of sins, which that that baptism is the door to the mysteries, to all of the mysteries, okay? Culminating, culminating with uh, the Holy uh, Eucharist. Okay, um, a couple of other sources of tradition and we'll move on. Uh, we already mentioned, uh, sorry, the next slide. We already mentioned the ecumenical councils. Um, like we said, we got the creed from there, but there is a lot of other canons. You know what a canon is? Uh, like the laws and the teachings and, and the rules that the, the guidelines that the church had given us um, uh, through those councils and even some after. Okay, and then the last part is the church history, which includes the, the early church history, the ancient history, as well as the lives of the saints, which is important for us to understand the Christian life. If we read about the life of a saint from beginning to, to the end of their life, uh, <coughs> it shows us how to live the Christian life, okay? Um, so, uh, just a few other verses and quotes and then we'll move on to the Coptic aspect. Can we change the next slide? So, kind of like what I was uh, saying before, St. John at the end of his gospel, he writes, there are also many other things that Jesus did. So basically he writes 21 chapters and he says that's <laughs> there's more than that, <laughs> right? He says, if if they were written one by one, I suppose even the whole world itself could not contain the books that would be written. And then he ends his gospel. So what is, what is he indirectly telling us? This is just the tip of the iceberg. Exactly. It's just so, so where's the rest of the iceberg? Holy tradition. <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> uh, also, um, uh, another early church writer, he wrote, um, we do not change the everlasting boundaries which our fathers have set, but we keep the tradition just as we received it, kind of like we received the baton. Um, but uh, one of the, uh, I think it was when Tedros was writing, we, we, we can't misunderstand what tradition really means because, yes, we, we take the baton and, and we pass it on to the next generation, but that doesn't mean it looks exactly the same. It's the same spirit, but there's room for adaptation or for, um, uh, for not, not an evolution, but you know, changing things to 
adapt to the, the life and times and culture. Okay? One, this is, church is one living example you know, of that. Um, so uh, Deacon Severus, I remember he uh, gave a talk when we were kids, like maybe about 20 years ago, and something stuck in my mind. He, he said that we have to change in order to remain the same. And this, he was talking about tradition. So that's basically what tradition is. We're changing to remain the same. So what's the same? The doctrine, the faith, the spirit, but some things are changing in order to keep that same spirit. Okay? <coughs> um, and then St. Basil also writes, we have received some from written sources, he's talking about tradition, while others have been given to us secretly through apostolic tradition. So he's saying some things are written down um, in the Bible and even in the early church writings, but uh, kind of like when, um, uh, when we, or we ordain a deacon right, to, uh, to sing and chant the hymns, right? he comes and stands and, 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 and sings the hymns, but there's a lot of learning that's going on, hopefully, <laughs> at home you know, with, with the teacher in the deacon's class, maybe um, with, with the <coughs> sorry, Sunday school teacher asking about you know, what are all these things mean? Why am I doing this? So that's the life that is behind the, what we see. Okay, um, okay. so um, we'll, we'll pass, skip this slide. We know who the patristics are, you know, I hope. Um, and uh, the next one as well. And we'll go into, so any questions so far relating to tradition or orthodoxy? Um, now you kind of understand how, like, how it's almost um, easy to understand now the difference between orthodoxy and everyone else. Except for Catholics, there's a lot of overlap even when we talk about tradition. They believe in the patristics, they believe in the sacraments. Um, so, uh, there's still a lot of o overlap there. Um, they're apostolic as well. So, now we go into what Coptic is. Um, I'm not going to give a long uh, description of this, but you know, the, the word Coptic just means Egyptian, right? Um, it was started, like we said earlier, um, <coughs> from the first century, when the Lord sent out the apostles to one region and, uh, or different regions in, in the world. Um, but the Coptic Church has a lot of special blessings. Um, not that we take pride in them, but that doesn't mean we're better <laughs> or the best. Okay? Um, for example, it was the only country that the, the Holy Family visited outside of the Holy Land, outside of Jerusalem. Um, but also, it's one of the few uh, areas in, in which the patriarch was, uh, or the first founder, was one of the evangelists. Okay, um, we can change this the next slide. Um, we know that, <laughs> where was the first church located? Where's the first communion? Hmm? The, the Last Supper, or is the, the Last Supper or the First Communion? In Jerusalem? St. Mark's house. <laughs> so I can say the first church was Coptic. <laughs> anyway, don't, don't say that when you're trying to <laughs> preach to someone. Um, but uh, that's something also we have to take great pride in. Um, <coughs> <coughs> sorry. Um, so that's the apostolic aspect because if, if you're trying to figure out if the person before you say, we're going to a, a church, you know, we're very traditional, say, well, are you apostolic? Well, what does that mean? Can you trace your priesthood or your leadership back to one of the apostles? Because, I mean, if, if you can't, then, you know, how can you um, accept the priesthood? If they don't have priesthood, then that's a whole other thing. <laughs> but if they do, and say, okay, is your priesthood, you know, um, authentic? Can can it be traced back to the 
the laying of the hands or the, the, the breath of the Lord Jesus Christ when he breathed on the face of the disciples and he gave them the priesthood. Um, <clears throat> so that's a big thing. Uh, okay, so with the early church history though, there's, um, we talk about the schisms or the divisions, we talk about the martyrs because Again, these are the living, the living examples of faith and the monastic uh, giants in, in, in our, our church, especially. And this is something unique. To, uh, a lot of churches now have uh, monks, but <coughs> Egypt pr pretty much is where it all started. Um, okay. Uh, we'll move on. So I'll... We can skip a couple of slides. I'm not going to go into the depth of uh, St. Mark's uh, life, but if you can go skip to the map. Yeah, we'll skip this part. Yeah, so in the early church, <coughs> there were like five main centers, just so that you could have a good understanding. Um, there was Rome, of course, um, Athens, Constantinople, Jerusalem, where it all started, and Alexandria. So we say these were the five great ancient seas or districts uh, or dioceses, if you will, uh, in which the church kind of like f was formed. Um, and that's helpful to understand because of what happens after. Okay? Um, so like we were saying, we had the three important uh, councils, and then 451 is when we and the Oriental churches uh, pretty much uh, separated, unfortunately, from the rest of the Christian groups, okay? So for us, you know, we have basically, we had nothing to do with them, <laughs> and they had nothing to do with us, which is sad, but in hindsight, there, it was a blessing in disguise because the, at least the Coptic church was able to preserve a lot of things um, in the meantime, okay? And we'll get back to that uh, in a little bit later. So in 1054, that's what we would call the Great Schism. That's when the Roman Catholic and the West uh, split from the Orthodox East. And then 500 or years la later or so, we had the Protestant Reformation. So the next slide is, I think you've seen this before, but this is like a, a brief summary of what happened to the church. So, uh, most of, if you notice, like especially when we start referring to a lot of our church fathers, we refer to the fathers before the split most of the time, okay? Um, and, and why do we do that when we talk with other Orthodox churches? Because they also recognize the same fathers. Well, they should, <laughs> right? Um, we still have a lot of patristics that happen, uh, that uh, writers that happen after that, but like, so we have Nicaea 325, Constantinople, Ephesus, Chalcedon, and then up there we say we are the non-Chalcedonian because we didn't accept Chalcedon as a, a, a council, okay? Um, and then the Chalcedonian churches, or the, we say the, the Greek, because the most popular, the Russian, um, and the rest of the Eastern churches, <coughs> which stayed with Rome until the Great Schism, okay? And then after that, it, it branches all over the place, like at the bottom there with, you know, with the Protestant Reformation and, and so forth. Um, any questions? So this is just a good visual for you to help understand you know, where we fit into all the categories of the different Christian groups. Okay? Um, hopefully one day it goes back you know, to one. Uh, and most likely that uh, we think that will happen before the second coming. Okay. Um, so uh, one key term that we like to repeat again is the apostolic succession. Again, that we can trace the priesthood and from, actually I should put, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ first, you know, right before St. Mark. Um, and then from generation to generation, there was a patriarch um, and uh, <coughs> a lot from all of the other apostolic churches can do the same. Okay. Um, let's see. The rest is, um, we'll go quickly over, but um, sometimes when we talk now, because of the, the, the martyrs uh, in the recent times, um, when, when people hear the word Coptic, a lot of times 
they remember the martyrs, uh, which is very good because it gives us a door to talk about the importance of martyrdom or the spirit of martyrdom, which has been since the beginning uh, of our church. Uh, and that's why, like, as you know, we start the calendar with what? Hmm? With, yes, with, with um, remembering the martyrs, right? But what is that date actually? September 11th, 284, what's that? You know? That's actually the reign of Diocletian. <laughs> so he's not, he's not a saint in our church, but because he was the one who persecuted probably the most number of Christians uh, <coughs> in, in throughout history, that's why we say, okay, that's, that's what we're going to start um, counting our years by. Okay. Um, we'll kind of skip... Uh, to the rest. Uh, the last part is the monasticism, which we can't ignore because, as you know, the leader of the church is, the Orthodox Church is, who? <laughs> God is the leader of our church, but like in the rankings of the church, we have the deacons, then we have the priests, then we have the bishops. And the Pope, who's first of the bishops, right? So all the bishops and the Pope, including the Pope, were from the monks. You, you know this, I'm just kind of... So that's why the church decided in her wisdom to say that the head of the church or the leaders of the church are going to be the ones from this specific rank. Um, and uh, there's a mystery behind it. We don't have time to discuss it. But we say... The, the monastic life was started, the, the official way of the monastic life was started by St. Anthony, but I mean, you can even go all the way up to Elijah, you know, the, the Tishbite in the Old Testament who, who lived, uh, you know, a monastic life in a sense. Um, but in the New Testament, after uh, the time of Christ, the organization of, of groups coming together and, and discipling each other in to live a, a life of strict asceticism and spirituality, this happened in Egypt. And people from all over the world flocked to Egypt, especially uh, St. Anthony, we call the lamp of monasticism. Um, <coughs> uh, and that's why the, the popular book that St. Athanasius wrote about him you know, spread like wildfire at that time. And even today, it's still a very popular um, uh, reading. So um, this is something that we, we can't forget to talk about because uh, this is like, in a sense, the heart of the spirituality of the church. Um, we, we depend a lot on the prayers and the, the, the life of, of the monks and the nuns um, in Egypt and, and here as well. Um, and it's very unique to, to even to the or other Orthodox churches. Yes, they have monks and, and and, and nuns and monasteries and whatnot, but even a lot of the monasteries were blessed by the Holy Family, and uh, they, uh, the history goes back for centuries, um, which not very many other churches have. Okay, so it's not just that it's old, but you know, when you're, let's say you you, you build something, and you kind of like, okay, the iPhone, right? And so you have second, third generation, you know, so iPhone 6 is how much better than the first generation, right? So imagine if it's maybe iPhone 6000, right? That's kind of like the Coptic Church, <laughs> in a sense. Again, not to be too proud, but be, because the monasticism has been out for 16 centuries or so, like, I think it's going to be a lot better than someone who decides to be a monk today and start their own monastery, you know, by themselves. Uh, so that's that's why we call we call upon the importance of the holy tradition. Okay, um, well, uh, that's pretty much what we have today. I think we can we can sk skip the slides. Um, I think that's one of the last slides that we have. Oh. Um, We'll continue the next week in the same theme, um, but yeah, just one last thing. I want to talk about the contemporary miracles. Contemporary is 1968, but uh, there's a lot of uh, continuation of this. Um, the Catholics have a lot also of, of miracles that happened to them 
for some reason I was searching, you know, contemporary miracles, you know, online, and they'd had like the top ten, <laughs> and the, and the first one that showed up was was uh, Zaytun. It, this was just a, <coughs> and the rest I think were like the Catholic <laughs> um, uh, miracles that happened, but. These are some of the inexplicable things um, that we can only attribute to God and, and the heavenly things. And so um, uh, I know a lot of people are still around who witness this. Uh, uh, and there's many miracles that are still going on in Egypt. We don't uh, focus on them entirely, but we also can't deny it because this is a, a easy proof or at least... Um, a sign to to the world that God is, you know, among us. Um, I think we'll leave it at that. Are there any questions? <coughs> sure. Um, we can, uh, yeah, we can either put it on the website or email you from from the G, from the Gmail, um, or. Which one? Power, the PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. Make sure you're on it, and we'll email <laughs> email you. Um, and the video itself also is going to be uploaded, right? I think all the uh, videos of the this meeting uh, are going to be uploaded eventually to to the site. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, may God give us grace to help us understand and love the church and be a good witness um, to those who ask us the reason for the hope that is in us uh, so that with meekness and fear we can present everyone perfect in Christ. And glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and from to the age of all ages. Amen. We'll pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen, our loving Lord. We thank you, we praise you, we bless you, we glorify you for all of your gracious gifts. We thank you for giving us the church as your heavenly bridegroom, and we thank you for allowing us to be a part or a member of the church, for each member is important for the glorification and the edification of the church. Help us to see our part, to enjoy the life and the love that we experience by being a part of the church, and let our let our deep connection with you and the church be manifest to others so that we can help others come to the knowledge of truth and be a good witness or response to those who ask us uh, any question, whether difficult or easy. Be our guide, be our hope and comfort and consolation, and help us to seek always the heavenly things instead of the earthly. Through the never-ending intercessions of the Lady of us all, the Holy Mother of God, St. Mary, St. Mark, the founder and, uh, and perfect of our church, all the choir of your saints who has pleased you since Adam to the end of the ages, make us worthy to pray with all thanksgiving. Our Father, who art in heaven, <coughs> on earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord. I am the King and the power of the Lord. Love of God the Father, grace is only begun. Son of Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. Communion, gift, fellowship, the Holy Spirit be with you. Depart in peace and peace of the Lord be with you.